There's this manga called Kanashiki Ikimonotachi, or The Sorrowful Creatures, and it's about a shaiba called Robert sitting on a bench exposing himself. He's lamenting the fact that he's so unpopular, and that he's not getting any action, when a fly named Catherine nervously buzzes over, watching in admiration. As she dives in for a closer look, Robert asks himself, is it finally happening? The Sorrowful Creatures is just a one-shot manga. It isn't long, and it isn't complicated, but what it is, is one step into the mad, mad world of manga. For every One Piece, Berserk, and Dragon Ball, there's an Ultra Heaven, a panorama of hell, a fable. In an industry so well known for brutal competition and merciless cancellations at its top end, there are thousands of less popular artists and writers creating weird, scary, inspiring manga series that don't necessarily hope for the attention of the masses. More personal and uncomfortable stories featuring disturbing content, extreme violence, and generally less market-friendly ideas, art styles, and pacing only very rarely become hits and go international, with even fewer getting anime adaptations, and almost none of them getting official translations. But thankfully, many of these lesser-known series do find their audience, and allow the mangaka to write or draw exactly what they want without having to chase trends or censor themselves. And in this video, I'm going to be recommending three of these lesser known series that might have slipped under the radar for a lot of people, and we'll start with my favourite zombie manga, Apocalypse no Teride. Apocalypse no Teride, or Fortress of the Apocalypse, is half zombie manga, half delinquent manga, with the story beginning as 16-year-old Yoshiaki Maeda is wrongly imprisoned at a juvenile reformatory just outside of Tokyo, just as the outbreak begins. It's not long before the prison guards are overrun and killed by zombies that make it inside, and Maeda has to rely on his cellmates, Yoshioka, a maniacal wildcard, Iwakura, the strong and silent pragmatist, and Yamanoi, a condescending academic, if he wants to survive against both the undead threat and their fellow inmates. And as intense as that is, it only gets more and more mental from that point on, with the appearance of a super-powered zombie ten-year-old, a militarised cult that worship the zombies, a psychic inmate who can literally see the future, and an intensification of the zombie outbreak as it spreads from humans, to animals, to something else entirely. And this is part of why I love manga as an art form. It's the individualism. Writer Yu Kuraishi is allowed to throw in any old shit he wants, whether or not it makes complete sense, as long as it's cool, expressive, interesting, or exciting. And with Apocalypse No Teride's short length at only around 50 chapters, it feels like an insane roller coaster that just keeps getting crazier. But all this madness never outshines the true heart of the story, and that's the group of friends at its centre. Maeda, Yoshioka, Iwakura, and Yamanoi have a bit of a fragile alliance with each other and with other allies they make along the way. But as they survive together and understand the circumstances that led to each other's incarceration, they become true friends that fight to protect each other. And like all the best zombie stories, it's not just about making it to tomorrow. In their fight to survive, the guys are careful to remember the things that make life worth living in the first place. For example, on a supply run into the city, Yoshioka leads the group to an old arcade without explaining why. When his friends realise he only came here to play a game, Iwakura is ready to knock some sense into him, but Maeda puts two and two together. This was the arcade Yoshioka's mum used to run. Yoshioka tells his friends that he used to spend all day playing this one pinball game in particular, that it's one of the few happy childhood memories he had in between his dad leaving and constantly fighting with his mum, before leaving home himself at a young age. He imagines her keeping this rundown arcade running all by herself, waiting for him to come home. The moment's shattered by a zombie attack, and he gets ready to abandon his hopes of having one last game in his mum's arcade. But his friends have his back, and take on the horde, giving him the time he needs. It's illogical, and it's dangerous, but it matters enough to Yoshioka, so it matters to Maeda, Yamanoi, and Iwakura. And that's the heart of this series in a nutshell. It's about a group of social outcasts sticking together and deciding for themselves what's important, despite overwhelming odds, which is thankfully a running theme in Kuraishi's work. And Apocalypse No Teride is a perfect introduction to Kuraishi's other series, Denjin N, and Starving Anonymous, which is… a bit weird. Kuraishi's great at leveraging his auteurship to show some seriously disturbing stuff. And on that note, 
I want to give a little content warning for the next manga we're about to discuss. If you're prone to struggling with your mental health, Himizu is not the manga for you. Written by Minoru Furuya, Himizu follows a similar trend to much of Furuya's other work in that the protagonist is a high-strung outcast that lives by their own bizarre rules. Yuichi Sumida, a high school student with a superiority complex, pushes people away with his misanthropic attitude. In the beginning of the story, he looks down on idealists, like these two cousins that want to become successful manga writers. But it quickly becomes clear that derision comes from the pain of lacking his own dream in life. Sumida doesn't want a lot of money, or fame, or any of that stuff the head in the clouds dreamers around them hope in vain for. He just wants to get on with living a simple, carefree life. Something that's becoming harder and harder to do as his situation in life deteriorates. He's living on the poverty line in a cramped, dirty shack. His absentee dad has outstanding debts, and it's Sumida that the collectors take their frustration out on. His mother decides to run off with her new boyfriend, leaving only a letter and some cash. And he keeps hallucinating a hideous, one-eyed monster that watches him from a distance. A constant symbol of the deep, dark feelings inside of him. It's no wonder that Sumida's been unable to visualise a dream to strive for. To dream is a privilege he just can't afford. And so resentment starts to build in Sumida, and he directs it at his dad. For never being there. For squandering the family's money. For acting like Sumida doesn't exist. And in a moment of weakness, when his dad comes home, then prepares to do his usual vanishing act, Sumida kills him. Sumida tells himself that murdering his dad wasn't something to feel guilty over, but the event does kickstart a moral conundrum inside Sumida. His sense of superiority evaporates, and he starts to see himself as a complete failure. But he sets himself a test, a deadline. He gives himself one year to become a good person, to live in a way that validates his life and benefits society in order to recover a certain something he lost with his dad's murder. And if he fails, he'll kill himself. The rest of the manga follows Sumida's quest to perform acts of justice, to find bad guys in society and eliminate their ability to hurt anyone. It's a task he struggles to accomplish, which you could read as a glowing review of the Japanese society that Himizu presents, but there are no opportunities for a person to be heroic, because this society is already so safe and harmonious. If not for the fact that Himizu depicts some of the sincerest depravity that humans are capable of. Himizu's villain gallery is made up of murderers, animal abusers, torturers. There's a painful irony when Sumida gives Toshio, a kindly homeless guy, a job at his parents' boat rental business, only for Toshio to turn out to be a rapist who frequently assaults women and even kidnaps Sumida's friend Chazawa. And it's all the more painful because Sumida had given him a chance as part of his desire to save his own soul. To explain the full impact Himizu had on me, I do have to spoil the ending. So this is your warning if you're interested in reading it for yourself. But at the end of a long string of failures to fulfil his desire, Sumida does take his own life. And that's the crux of Himizu. It's a story about a person who doesn't get better. It's anti-catharsis. Sumida doesn't fail to achieve his heroic goal, but recognise that what he desired wasn't so important after all. It isn't bittersweet. He doesn't swap his want for a need. He fails completely and utterly, holds himself to a crushing standard, and believes the worst things he tells himself. And if, like me, you believe that stories about everything have a right to exist, even ones as brutally bleak as this, you'll hopefully see the value of the questions Himizu presents. Is it the society Sumida lives in that failed to offer him the right opportunities? Was it his upbringing, his parents, a natural dearth of luck? Is it really down to him? Are his failures all his own fault? I think Furuya's intention is for the reader to decide. And whether or not these questions are even worth asking, their impact is felt most powerfully in the aftermath of a story like this. Furuya has a talent for writing about the moral quests of societal outsiders, and there are a lot of manga writers that tend to have these running character themes through most of their work. And this is definitely true of Nobuyuki Fukumoto, author of series like Kaiji, Akagi, and Buriden Gai. But if I was to compare his series Saikyo Densetsu Kurosawa, or Legend of the Strongest Kurosawa, to anything, Fukumoto's other series wouldn't be first. The way that Kurosawa begins the story, wishing to be more popular with his subordinates at his construction job, is most reminiscent to me of David Brent from The Office and his desperate attempts at interpersonal magnetism. 
Kurosawa's a lonely man. He's 44 years old and single, with no real life achievements to speak of, and he's lived that way for a long time. But following Japan's loss to Turkey in the 2002 World Cup, Kurosawa realises that he can no longer tolerate just cheering on others, and decides to start supporting himself just as somebody would support their national team. And so Kurosawa kickstarts his own quest of self-improvement. He's tired of being beneath the notice of the people around him. He wants to be popular, to quell the desperate loneliness that's tearing him apart inside. This quest makes up the early chapters of the series, with Kurosawa trying to win over his co-workers with little schemes, but having his intentions misunderstood and coming off even worse than before. His antics reach beyond the workplace too, like when he finds a lost child at the park and attempts to take it home, before earnestly bonding with the kid, only to be arrested on charges of child kidnapping. No matter what he does to try and improve his situation, Kurosawa is beaten back by life itself constantly failing to achieve the fulfilment that he wants. And the series continues as this kind of slice of life gag manga for a while, until Kurosawa eventually earns some sympathy from his co-workers and takes them for a drink. Then when some local delinquents harass his co-workers, Kurosawa drunkenly defends them, only to be mugged by those same delinquents on the way home. He's saved by his co-workers at the last minute, and soon after he invites them out again, to make a declaration. He's going to hunt down and take on the people that attacked him. But more than that, starting today, he's going to fight back against the overbearing life he's been living. He doesn't want to be like an animal who finds victory and survival alone. Kurosawa wants to take the wheel in his own life, fight against the forces bringing him down, against the mindset he's lived with his whole life. And unbeknownst to Kurosawa, the bar is full of other people like him, like this 28-year-old part-time worker lamenting his dull job and his lack of love and a dad that can't bring himself to criticise his son for skipping school, cause he himself fucking loathes having to go to work every day. And as all of these guys listen in on Kurosawa's declaration, they start to idolise him for saying out loud what they haven't even had the courage to hope for, something worth fighting for. And despite the differences between Kurosawa as a series and Fukumoto's other work, this is one commonality. Among Fukumoto's many talents as a writer is his ability to enshrine his main characters as heroes to those around them, as these messiahs of the downtrodden that represent either a brighter future for those taken advantage of by criminal organisations or a corrupt and heartless society, or a way of striking back against them. Kaiji does this constantly, as do protagonists Guy and Zero in the respective series. These guys are heroes to the penniless, socially immobile nadir of their society, as much as they're heroes to us. And there's an intense catharsis in watching them vocalise to their heroes what we wish we could. Undying support. So when these depressed, shiftless, working class guys hang out on a balcony overlooking the delinquent kids' school, while Kurosawa waits anxiously by the gate for them to get out of class, they're not just looking for some entertainment. They want to watch the genuine spectacle of someone like them, who's been shit on by the world for their entire life, take a stand and fight back. And just as history feels like it's repeating itself, Kurosawa lands the first strike of his war against the world. The delinquents are stunned, Kurosawa's astonished, and the downtrodden audience are fucking overjoyed. And so are we. This fight is the story's beginning coming full circle, with Kurosawa being cheered for instead of him cheering for a football team. And though this might feel like the climactic end to Kurosawa's journey, this is just the beginning. Kurosawa's fearsome attitude in the fight earns him a reputation as a powerful fighter, a reputation that haunts him from then on, as fighters from all corners of the delinquent underworld try to make a name for themselves by taking him down, leading him to keep fighting the war he began in increasingly extreme ways, building towards an electrifying conclusion that I refuse to spoil. Never before have I seen a series that begins as one story and ends as another to such an insane degree. It'll amaze you if you only give it a chance. Just like Apocalypse No Turide, and Himizu, and Kanashiki Akemonitachi, they might not be what everybody's talking about, but they should be.